ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله وسلم عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد to proceed as much as that we have set aside friday night for a general lecture or to catch up on any classes that had to be postponed or canceled or anything of the sort and i've been traveling for a couple of weeks I want to use the opportunity tonight to catch up a little bit on the tremendous book of Al Imam Shaykh al Islam Ibn al Qayyim Rahimullah Ta'ala. It's called Iqatha al Ahfan. And this book, as we have come to see, and we are now in the sixth chapter, it is a book that is entirely about the reality of the heart and being able to understand what drives a human being and motivates a human being. And the fact that his heart to his limbs is like a general over or a commander over his troops. And that if the heart is correct, then the body will be correct. And if the heart is corrupt, then the body will be corrupt. We've come to see the connection of the Shahadatain, of the fact that nothing has a right to be worshipped other than Allah. And the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a messenger of Allah to the correction of the heart. And how the entirety of the islah, the rectitude, the correction of the heart, it goes back to correcting the two abilities of the heart, which are the quwa of al idrak and the quwa of al irada. And the ability of the heart to know and to differentiate between right and wrong, beneficial and harmful, firstly. And secondly, the ability of the heart to love and to choose. And once it knows what is right from what is wrong, what is true from what is false, what is beneficial from what is harmful, what is advantageous for it as opposed to what is detrimental to it, that it chooses that for itself. And the knowledge of the heart is epitomized and the epitome of the knowledge of the heart is found in the revelation that came to the Prophet wasallam. correcting the knowledge of the heart comes about by what came of knowledge to the Prophet wasallam for the guidance of mankind in their affairs as regards their deen, their dunya, and the hereafter. And the intention of the heart, therefore, is epitomized in the statement that nothing has a right to be worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the heart singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the highest object of its love, the highest object of its hope, the highest object of its fear, and relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is that which will correct the heart of the person, and yani their heart having beneficial knowledge and the effect of that beneficial knowledge of the actions of the heart, the statements of the tongue and the actions of the limbs. And this is the reality of the affair. And this is why the affair of aqeed and manhaj, and yani the affair of proper beliefs and proper methodologies can never be, and proper methodology can never be discounted. And yani it is something that is at the cornerstone of building a community. And this is something that in, or to a large degree, you know, the communities in this country, in the United States of America, as long as Islam has been in this country and you have families in this country, American families that are in their fourth, fifth generation of Islam. And you, but we haven't progressed how we need to progress religiously. And, you, and we are in a time that is very trying. وَمَا مِنْ عَامٍ إِلَّا وَالَّذِي بَعْدَهُ شَرٌ مِنْهُ and there is not a year that passes except that the one that comes after it will be worse than it up until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to face the challenges of the fitan that come about, we must have these two affairs corrected for ourselves. Yani our knowledge must be correct. Our understanding of the religion, lafdan wa ma'anan as regards its wordings and its meanings, must be corrected first and foremost. And then we must allow that to take its proper course, seeking the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as regards the effect that it has upon our hearts and our behavior and our treatment of others in these sorts of affairs. 
and this is that which will bring about rectitude for the society. Ala kulli, whatever the case, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, and he based his book upon this affair, and he, that the correctness of the heart, according to what is found in the book of Allah, and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and the statements of the Salaf, that the correctness of the heart, it goes back to correcting its knowledge and understanding, and goes back to correcting its intention and its love, yani the function of the heart, and he to love and to intend. And this is rectified by this by La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And this is that which will protect the people from every fitna. As we heard, that Al Fitna Fitna Tan, Fitna to Shubuhat wa Fitna to Shahawat. That fitna is of two types, the fitna of a shubuhat and the fitna of a shahawat. Every calamity, every disaster, every harm that befalls the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a punishment from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala as regards the Muslims getting caught up in one of these two fitan, one of these two types of trials, the trial of doubts or the trial of desires. And so by the people correcting their understanding of their religion, they will be safe from harmful doubts and by their correcting their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making Allah in the hereafter and seeing the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the highest objective, their desires will come into check and their any lust and their wants and ambitions for that which is harmful will be cured and this is something that is discussed in a lot of detail in these first 13 chapters of the book and we have reached the sixth chapter we have reached the sixth chapter and slightly before uh, this sixth chapter we heard that there are two parables that are given in the Quran as regards the effects of the revelation upon the human being uh, two parables in the Quran as regards the effects of the revelation upon the human being and that both of those parables that are found in the Quran and likewise in the Sunnah as regards the effects of the revelation upon the human being they are summarized in Surah Al-Ra'd in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah said Anzala mina sama'i ma'an fasalat awdiyatun bi qadariha and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down rainwater from the heavens and the valleys therefore overflow according to their measure and they flow according to their measure they fill up with the rainwater the rainwater here being the uh, parable the similitude for the revelation and the valleys here being what the hearts so some valleys are wide, uh, vast big wide deep and they can accommodate a great deal of knowledge and understanding of that knowledge and love of that knowledge because this is what is meant by any the hearts being like the valleys and the, they're being of different sizes and he is that any the hearts of some people are vast and deep and so when you're going to their knowledge of the religion the love of the religion the understanding they have of the religion is how much they have an aspiration to learn it and to pass it on to others and so on and so forth and some of them are tight and restricted and he but still have a portion of the religion within them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said فَحْتَمَلَ سَيْلُ زَبَدًا رَابِيًا and the flood water carries off the froth and the scum off of the face of the earth and, this, and the scum here the scholars say being a shubuhat wa shahawat when the revelation and he, the knowledge of the religion comes to the person that has come in the book of Allah and the son of the Prophet وسلم, it does away or the effect that it is supposed to have is that it does away with shubuhat and shahawat and it does away with uh, doubts and desires, doubts and harmful desires for the human being. And Allah Taala gave the second parable, which is what he remembers the second parable, fire. Allah Taala said, "Wa mima yuqiduna alayhi fi nari ibtiqai ibtiqai fitnatin fitnatin ibtiqai hiliyatin wa matain zabadun mithlu. Wa mima yuqiduna alayhi fi nari ibtiqai hiliyatin wa matain zabadun mithlu." And that which likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they heat in the fire, meaning of gold and precious metals, intending thereby to fashion into jewelry or into uh, ornaments or uh, vessels or the likes. Zabadun mithlu. And it likewise has a zabad, it likewise has a froth or a scum that is found inside of the metal. That is found inside of the metal. And so when the fire purges, when the fire is placed in the metal, it purges the metal of any of these scum. Allah Ta'ala wa and as such does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strike the falsehood with truth 
وأما زبد فيذحب جفاء وأما ما يمكث وأما ما ينفع الناس فيمكث فيمكث في الأرض as for the زبد يعني that which is useless then it يعني it departs and it goes away to, to no avail or any benefit to anyone and as for that which uh, benefits mankind then it remains upon the earth and this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he sets forth parables for mankind so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has compared the revelation and the effect that it has upon the human being to be like the rainwater falling from the heavens and like the fire that purges filth and impurities from gold and so this is the parable of the religion as regards life and as regards light and these are the two things that are mentioned all throughout the Quran and likewise in the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, about the two functions of the heart we said the two functions of the heart was the ability to know and the ability to intend the ability to know and distinguish and the ability to love and intend and the knowledge of the heart is what is meant by in the parables in the Quran by the light of the heart and the intention and love of the heart is what is meant by the life of the heart is what is meant by the life of the heart and this is something that is tremendous to understand as we mentioned in the beginning of the book in the khutbah of the book the introductory sermon of al-imam ibn qayyim rahimullah ta'ala before the first chapter that the <coughs> favor of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the ummah muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is tremendous and as much as that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the Muslims to be able to see that which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to see and to be able to understand, to see and have vision with their hearts, to understand and to grasp and that which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see as regards the realities of the heart and what occurs in the hearts and the functions of the hearts and these sorts of affairs. And so continuing with the uh, sixth chapter, the sixth chapter again being as Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he said fi anna la sa'adata lil qalb wa la ladhata wa la na'im wa la salah illa bi an yakuna illa bi an yakuna Allahu huwa ilahuhu wa fatiruhu wahdahu huwa ma'buduhu wa ghayatu matlubihi wa ahabba ilayhi min kulli ma siwahu the sixth chapter again it is about the fact that there is no way that the heart can ever feel happiness or pleasure or bliss or correctness or experience correctness and rectitude unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is recognized by the heart to be its deity its creator alone who alone deserves the right to be worshipped and is the highest ambition and goal of the person and that the person in their endeavor that they pursue the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah is more beloved to the human being than everything besides him subhanahu wa ta'ala and this comes on the hills of the fifth chapter that is entitled that the light of the heart and the health of the heart does not come about unless the person is mudrikan al haq muridan lah, mu'thiran lahu ala ghayrihi. Unless a person knows the truth, wants the truth, and prefers the truth over every other thing. So then Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, and he follows that up. And he, that the entirety of the life of the heart and the light, uh, or the life of the heart and the health of the heart goes back to the person knowing the truth wanting the truth and preferring the truth over every other thing that the highest truth and the most important truth and that which is any the key to understanding every truth and every reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone has the right to be worshipped the reality of the importance of the tawheed of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala as regards all of his rights that he has singled out with his names his attributes his actions and his right to be worshipped subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore he becomes the highest objective in the life of the person tabarak wa ta'ala and more beloved to the person and everything besides him Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala after explaining the first aspect I will do a slight review inshallah of the first two aspects on one day inshallah I want to keep uh, pedaling back and, and doing too much review <coughs> Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala, he mentioned seven places in the Qur'an He mentioned seven places in the Qur'an Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned The importance of al, uh, Al-ibadah wa tawakkul Connected to each other Al-ibadah wa tawakkul Connected to each other And he worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Which is the thing that a person loves more than anything else And is more beneficial to him than anything else And how to be able to worship Allah which is to seek the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to seek the assistance of Allah and that which is most hated to the person being that which is the opposite of that which is a shirku billah the most dangerous thing on the face of the earth the most the greatest evil in existence and the worship of anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that which will protect a person from a shirku billah which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a person seeking the assistance of Allah and placing their reliance upon Allah and so he explains that the correctness of the heart, it goes back to al-ibadah wa tawakkul, al-ibadah wa tawakkul, yani a person worshipping Allah along with our partners and placing their reliance upon Allah, then he says al wajhu thani the second aspect of around 10 aspects and this is the longest chapter of the book of uh, the first 13 chapters in particular of the book which is the introduction of the longer book which is 1300 plus pages, we're only going over the first 1300, uh, the first 13 chapters, 1300 the first 13 chapters, we're not going to read 1300 pages. Um, <clears throat> the second aspect of this chapter, the sixth chapter, which is I mean, the most important of these 13 chapters, he says, Al Wajhu Thani. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Khalaq al Khalqa li ibadatihi al Jami'ati li ma'rifatihi wal inabati ilayhi wa mahabbatihi wal ikhlasi lah. He said, Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation to worship Him? And the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is summarized by the following things. Ma'rifatihi, knowing Allah. Al-inabati ilayhi, constantly turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in devotion. Wa mahabbatihi, loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal ikhlasi lah, and making one's endeavor and their actions sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, knowing Allah turning to Allah in devotion, which is called Al-Inaba, Mahabbatihi, loving Allah, wal ikhlas ilah. Al-Inaba is Al-Ruju' ila Allah, and he returning to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in many places in the Qur'an, and he, that from the descriptions of the believers, is Al-Inaba. As Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he said about the advice of Luqman to his son, وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيَّ He told his son as an advice, to his son and follow the path of those that make al-inaba to me and follow the path of those that make al-inaba meaning al-ruju' to me subhanahu wa ta'ala and so al-inaba is al-ruju' ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said ya ayatuha nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya fadkhuli fi ibadi wadkhuli jannati O oh, soul that is in a state of tu'manina, in a state of happiness or contentment and peace. And the only way to find this peace is by the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come back to your Lord, return back to your Lord. Huh? Please with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah being pleased with you. And enter into my, uh, into being amongst my ibad and therefore you will enter into my jannah. So this is the reality of Al-Inaba, is that once a person knows Allah, that they prepare for the return to Allah, the journey to Allah, the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they send rocket ships into outer space, uh, and they, NASA and different scientific organizations, when they build rocket ships, they look at every single detail of a person who's going on a mission. You know, they're going to put a human being and a lot of resources and time and energy and so on and so forth to uh, putting somebody into orbit right we don't say putting them on the moon because I don't really believe that they ever put anybody on the moon and this was a position of many of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah and this is a position of many of the kuffar uh, that, 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 the, that the moon landing was a hoax but that's a whole different bag of chips uh, if you were to send somebody into outer space right they take every precaution every preparation I mean, night and day, making sure that there are no any openings, gaps, weaknesses, anything like that. Now imagine your soul is going to take a journey upon death to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And according to how you journey to, towards Allah in this life will be your journey at the time of death. And a person who didn't give any attention to the fact that their soul is going to be ripped out of their body, taken by angels, wrapped up in any cloaks of uh, uh, garments of silk or garments of sackcloth and the likes of these things taken into the heavens and their journey to Allah and their meeting with Allah and their initial meeting 
when they are taken in front of the throne of Ar-Rahman Ta'ala before their soul is placed back into their body uh, up until the day of judgment and the likes of these affairs imagine a person who doesn't pay any attention or give any importance to that journey that he's about to take in the blinking of an eye and in the reality of his affair and so this is the importance of Al-Inaba Al-Inaba is a concept and he summarizes what the Salaf were upon the return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why it comes in a hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr, collected by Al Hafid al Mundirin and Targhib al Tarheeb, greater to be Hassan by Shaykh al Albani rahimullah ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Salahu awwali hadihi al Ummah bil zuhdi wal yaqeen. That the rectitude, the correctness of the first part of this nation came about by zuhd and yaqeen. By zuhd. Zuhd is a raghba to amma. And he is a person being disinterested in anything that will harm him in the hereafter. Anything that's going to get in between him and his journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think that's going to be an, an aqaba mean an aqabat, yani uh, obstacle in the path between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has zuhd, wal yaqeen, a certainty. A zuhd, yani disinterest in anything that will harm a person in the hereafter, a certainty. So Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala. When he mentioned in uh, his tremendous book, Ilam al Muwaqi'een, Al Rabbi Al Alameen, in the beginning of, his, of that tremendous book, when he mentioned the history of how knowledge was passed on from the ulama, from the ulama of this nation, from the scholars of this nation, and they were generally any four to six, and you could say nine scholars that passed on knowledge to the Hijaz, to Iraq, to Asham, and elsewhere. And yani the knowledge of the Ummah spread from these scholars. And he mentioned the evidences for following the obligation of following the Sahaba of the Prophet Wasallam, and whether the statements of the companions are an evidence in the religion or not. And he mentioned and he, this verse that we heard from Surah Luqman as the first evidence for that. And that is mandatory to follow the way of the companions of the Prophet and their understanding as regards every single affair. A ramen noodle stuck to my coffee. <laughs> he mentioned this verse in Surah Al Luqman when Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala said, Wattabi' sabila man anaba ilayya. The Luqman said to his son, and follow the path of the people of Al Inaba, of those that make Al Inaba, those that are returning back to me, those that are turning to me in devotion, constantly turning towards me in devotion. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala said. And so this quality and you think about how Ibn Qayyim could have mentioned almost anything else as the first evidence but he mentions this as the first evidence for following the way of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. this is the quality of the companions of the Prophet and Imam Malik he said along these lines that the latter part of this nation will not be corrected except by that which uh, corrected the early part of this ummah. And so this is what they were upon in summary, that they knew Allah and they were doing everything in their capability for the preparation to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the worship of Allah is gathered within these things. So I just want to spend a little bit of time on that word al-inaba. Al-inaba. People hear concepts and they don't understand the scholars have written great detail about each and every one of these concepts that you'll hear, al-ma'rifa, al-inaba, al-khawf, al-raja, al-mahabba, these sorts of affairs. He said, and he, the worship of Allah is summarized and gathered within the following things, knowing Allah, al-inaba tu ilayhi, wal-inaba ti ilayhi, and turning to Allah in devotion, and he, the return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa mahabbatihi and loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wal-ikhlasi lah, and being sincere in one's worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, this is the summary of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَبِي ذِكْرِهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَتَسْكُنُ نُفُوسُهُمْ So by, therefore, by remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts find peace and their souls find tranquility. وَبِرُؤْيَتِهِ فِي الْآخِرَةِ تَقَرُّ عُيُونُهُمْ And by... Seeing Allah in the hereafter, the eyes will find the coolness, I mean, the highest level of coolness and enjoyment and, and enjoyment. وَيَتِمُّ I mean, And their bliss will have become completed. I mean, their bliss will not be 
complete until they see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hereafter. فَلَا يُعْطِيهِمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ شَيْئًا هُوَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا أَقَرُّ لِعُيُونِهِمْ وَلَا أَنْعَمَ لِقُلُوبِهِمْ مِنَ النَّظْرِ إِلَيْهِ وَالسِّمَاعِ كَلَامِهِ مِنْهُ بِلَا وَاسِطَةً وَلَا مِعْطِيهِمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا شَيْئًا خَيْرًا لَهُمْ تبارك وتعالى ولا أحب إليهم ولا أقر لعيونه من الإيمان به ومحبته والشوق إلى لقائه والأنس بقربه والتنعم بذكره تبارك وتعالى. So he says so by remembering Allah and mentioning Allah سبحانه وتعالى then their hearts find peace and their souls find tranquility and by seeing Allah in the hereafter likewise their eyes will find the highest level of coolness and comfort and their bliss will become complete. And so Allah has not given them anything in the hereafter that is more beloved to them. That is more beloved to them. Or that is more comforting to their eyes or more blissful for their hearts than looking at Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hearing him speak subhanahu wa ta'ala without any wasita, without anyone between you and Allah to convey to you the words of Allah. وَلَمْ يُعْتِيهِمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا شَيْئًا خَيْرًا لَهُمْ And just as that is the case, he says, Therefore Allah has not given them anything in the dunya that is better for them, or more love to them, or more cooling to their eyes and pleasing and comforting to their eyes. Than al imani bihi, and belief in him, having proper belief in him, wa mahabbatihi, and loving him, wa shauqi ila liqaihi, and a shauq, a shauq with the qaf, a shauq, anxiousness to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wal unsi bi qurbihi, and finding comfort in seeking nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa tana'um bi dhikrihi, and enjoying your remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the remembrance of Allah is the entire religion and a person when they remember Allah they are either remembering his names, his attributes and his actions or his blessings or they are remembering his orders and his prohibitions or his reward or his punishment and everything connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is included in the dhikr of Allah that's why these circles of knowledge are called hilaqu dhikr they are called the circles of dhikr are called the circles of dhikr because the dhikr of Allah is not just dhikr. The dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the entire religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what means and indeed we send down the dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidun and indeed we will safeguard it. The dhikr, I mean the entire religion, the revelation. And so there is nothing that is better for them in this world, more comforting to their eyes than believing in Him, loving Him, anxiousness to meet Him, Finding comfort in, seeking nearness to Him, وَتَنَعُمْ بِذِكْرِهِ And enjoying one's remembrance of Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a hadith uh, along, that, along those lines as regards and enjoying one's remembrance of Allah. And that a person, I mean, that shows us the enjoyment that a person feels by, the pleasure a person feels by seeking beneficial knowledge and learning things of the religion and having an intellectual curiosity that drives him to learn about that which is beneficial to him in his deen and his dunya. When the Prophet وسلم, he said, Man human la yashba'an. And there are two hungers or thirsts that can never be quenched. Man humun fil ilmi la yashba' wa man humun fil dunya la yashba'. And a thirst or hunger for knowledge can never be satisfied, and a thirst or hunger for the dunya in the same way can never be satisfied. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala said وَقَدْ جَمَعَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بَيْنَ هَذَيْنَ الْأَمْرَيْنَ فِي الدُّعَاءِ الَّذِي رَوَاهُ النَّسَائِ وَالْإِمَامُ أَحْمَدْ وَبِنُ حِبَّانِ فِي صَحِيهِهِ وَغَيْرِهِمْ مِنْ حَدِيثِ عَمَّارِ بِنْ يَاسِرْ He said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gathered between these two things which are the most pleasurable thing in the hereafter and the most pleasurable thing for the believer in this world or for any human being therefore in the world Right. He gathered between these two things in the dua that was reported by An Nasai and Imam Ahmed and Ibn Hibban in his Sahih from the hadith of Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu. But the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yad'u bihi used to make the following dua. And in the narration mentioned that Ammar ibn Yasir 
on one occasion led the people in the salat wa aujas and then he shortened the salat he made the salat very short but and he, when he was in sajda he made a long sajda and he was making dua and he told the people that he made this following dua he made this following dua and he taught the people this dua the prophet used to make this dua it's a tremendous dua and it's lengthy Allahumma bi ilmi kal ghayb wa qudratika ala al khalq. O Allah, by your knowledge of the unseen and your power over the creation. Ahyini ma alimta al hayata khayrani. Wa tawaffani idha kanat al wafatu khayrani. O Allah, by your knowledge of the unseen and your power over the creation, allow me to live so long as life is better for me and let me die when death is better for me. Uh, a person. He makes tawassal by these two attributes of Allah, which are what? Allah's knowledge of the unseen and His power over the creation. Where else does a person make tawassal with these two attributes? What are the dua? Good try. Istikhara. Salat al istikhara. Right? So, Salat al istikhara, he is asking Allah to help him with a decision, to choose what is better for him. He is seeking from Allah that Allah, and He guides him to the best course of action. Right? As regards the affair, the deen of the dunya, marriage, divorce, and who you're going to take as a business partner, these sorts of things. Right? Tayyib. Here, the Prophet ﷺ is using the same two attributes of Allah. The knowledge of Allah and the power of Allah. As regards that which is beyond that, which is what? Oh Allah, allow me by your knowledge of the unseen and your power over the creation, allow me to live as long as life is better for me. And let me die when death is better for me. Allah. As regards, as regards his life and his death, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? There's nothing more definite than that, certain than life and death, right? It's a very high affair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned in the last verses of uh, Surah Al-Talaq that he created everything and sent down the revelation and decreed the maqadir لِتَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَرْ أَحَاطَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا Allah created us and everything in the heavens and the earth uh, and he sent down the revelation so that we can know that Allah has power over all things and Allah encompasses everything in knowledge Allah created us and He sent down the revelation and He set the maqadir for these so that we can know as human beings about the knowledge of Allah and the power of Allah. To the point that Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala said in Shafa al alir that all of, the names and the, all of the meanings of the names and the attributes of Allah go back to the meanings of these two attributes of Allah, al-ilm wal qudra the knowledge of Allah and the power of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the attributes of Allah directly go back to these two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as regards his names, his attributes and his actions tabarak wa ta'ala tayyib <coughs> he said wa as'aluka khashyataka wa as'aluka khashyataka fil ghaybi wa shahad O oh Allah and I ask you to be able to fear you with a knowledge based fear fil ghaybi wa shahad and he went alone and, and in that which is private and unseen to the people and that which is witnessed by the people and that which is private and that which is public. And I ask you to be able to always speak the truth no matter whether angry or pleased. And I ask you for moderation during poverty and during richness. And I ask you for na'im, for bliss that is everlasting. Wa as'aluka, and this is the shahid here. Uh, this is what Ibn Qayyim is mentioning. Allah combined between the best thing in this world and the best thing in the hereafter. Uh, this is after that. He said, Wa as'aluka qurra ta'ini la tanqati' Wa as'aluka rida ba'da al-qada. O Allah, and I ask you for coolness of the eye that will never go away. That will never go away. And I ask you to be pleased after you have decreed an affair to occur to me. 
وأسألك برد العيش بعد الموت and I ask you for a cool life after death وأسألك and here it is here وأسألك لذة النظر إلى وجهك والشوق إلى لقائك في غير ضراء مضرة ولا فتنة مضلة Oh Allah and I ask you for the pleasure of looking at your face and the anxiousness to meet you there's two things the best thing in the hereafter and the best thing in this world as Ibn Al-Qaim is explaining here the best thing in the hereafter to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the best thing in this world to have an anxiousness to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi ghayri dharra'a mudirratin wa la fitnatin mudilla and without going through some great tremendous harm in this world or without any fitna mudilla and without any fitna leading me astray without any fitna leading me astray Allahumma zayyina bi zinat al-iman Allahumma zayyina bi Allahumma zayyina bi zinat al-iman waj'alna hudatan muhtadin O oh Allah and then he closes the dua O oh Allah and beautify us with the beauty of faith and make us guided and a source of guidance for others make us those that are guides for others who are rightly guided so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ibn Al-Qaim he said فَجَمَعَ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam فِي هَذَا دُعَى الْعَظِيمَ الْقَدْرِ بَيْنَ أَطْيَا بِشَيْءٍ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَهُوَ شَوْقُ إِلَى لِقَائِهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَأَطْيَا بِشَيْءٍ فِي الْآخِرَى وَهُوَ نَظْرُ إِلَى وَجْهِهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in this dua that has a tremendous status or the proper rather Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this dua that has a tremendous status he gathered between the most enjoyable thing in this world which is the anxiousness to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the most enjoyable thing in the hereafter which is to look at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَمَّا كَانَ كَمَالُ ذَلِكَ وَتَمَامُهُ مَوْقُوفًا عَلَىٰ عَدْمِ مَا يَضُرُّ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَيَفْتَنُ فِي الدِّينَ وَيُفْتِنُ فِي الدِّينَ قَالَ فِي غَيْرِ ذَرَّائٍ مُضِرَّ وَلَا فِتْنَةٍ مُضِلَّ he said, and as much as that, the only way that a person can truly, completely enjoy those two things is dependent upon not being harmed tremendously in this world. If a person is in a condition of harm, extreme poverty, hunger, so on and so forth, their mind is going to be distracted from the worship of Allah, anxiousness to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the likes of these affairs. And he fitna, it busies the minds of the people. And it destroys the minds of the people. As the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked about any a time where the qatil would not know why he killed and the maqtul would not know why he had been murdered. And the murder would not know why he committed murder. And the one who was murdered would not know why he had been murdered. The companions, they said, وَأَيْنُ عُقُولَ النَّاشِ يَوْمِ إِذِينَ The Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ ذَهَبَتْ عُقُولُهُمْ he said, where will the minds of people be at that time? The Prophet ﷺ said, they will have lost their minds. The people will have lost their minds. It's the reality of the affair. Fitna slows down progress and, and, and a person advancing in their religion and these sorts of affairs. So by the scholars, they say that the eight things that were mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ, that he used to seek refuge from. Alayhi salatu wasalam, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min alhammi wal hazan. O oh Allah, I seek your refuge from uh, worry and sadness or wal ajazi wal kasal and from helplessness and laziness or min jubni wal bukhul and from cowardice and greed wa min ghalabat al dain wa min dhila al dain wa ghalabat al rijal and from being overcome by debt or overcome by men, overcome by other human beings. They said that these eight things that the Prophet ﷺ saw refuge from are the greatest interferers between the person was sayri Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and journeying towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the person that is sad, worried, stressed out or the person who is and he, greedy uh, as was said by Hatim al-Asam he said rahmatullahi alayhi he said man za'ama annahu yurid al-jannah وَلَا يُنْفِقُوا مِنْ مَالِهِ فَهُوَ كَاذِبٍ And the person who claims that he wants a Jannah but won't spend from his money is a liar. The person who claims he wants a Jannah but won't spend his money is a liar. Huh? And he, a person that won't spend, a person that they know the good, 
but they know the good has all sorts of tahadiyat connected to it, makari affairs that are challenges and disliked things connected to it. And so they're what? They're afraid. They're a coward. They won't advance towards the hereafter. They won't advance towards the hereafter because they're helpless or because they're lazy or because they're overcome by debt and poverty or they're overcome by other people in the likes of these affairs. And so when the people are going through, as the Prophet he said here, he sought refuge from the ra'i mudirra, and he from great harm, from great harm. And he, because it prevents a person from progressing in his religion. And he, a person should never and he, put himself in a situation where he humiliates himself, as the Prophet he said in authentic hadith. Ahmed and others, the Prophet he said, لا ينبغي للمؤمن أن يضل نفسه يتعرض للبلاء في ما لا يطيق. It is not befitting for the believer to humiliate himself by subjecting himself to be tried in a manner that he cannot bear. See some people, right? And a controversy comes up, fitna comes up. I wish such and such and such and such would happen. I wish they would lock me up. I wish they <laughs> would come and kick my door down. I said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Some people they always want something to happen. You know, they always, you know, it's not it's not right unless it's wrong, right? Some people they love controversy like that. The Prophet Sallallahu he understood. And he talked to his companions, Radiallahu Anhum wa Ardahum, and he that fitna, and he that fitna in this manner. And he fitness as regards the dunya, as regards poverty and affliction and these sorts of things, is something that a person is to, is to try to flee away from as far as possible. And he, a person, he flees away from any you know, confusion and from harm and so on and so forth. And for this reason, any, because any being harmed severely in this world would prevent him from any being able to journey towards Allah and having that full anxiousness to meet Allah. And likewise, he said, "Wala fitna tin mudilla," and without any fitna that leads me astray, because that, and he comes in between the person and his religion. And he this harms a person in his religion or in his dunya. That harms a person in his deen. The Prophet Sallallahu he saw refuge from these two things. Wala makana kamalul abdi fi an yakuna aliman bilhaq, muttabi'an lah, muallima li ghairihi, murshidan lah. Qala jalna wa jalna huda tamuhtadin. He said, and as much as that the completeness of the person, and a person having the best situation possible comes about by his knowing the truth, following the truth, and teaching it to others, and guiding them to it, the Prophet Sallallahu closed the dua by saying, وَجْعَلْنَا هُدَى تَمْمُحْتَدِينَ And O oh Allah, make us those that are guided, that are a source of guidance for others. Make us those that are guides for others, that are rightly guided ourselves. وَلَمَّا كَانَ الرِّضَى النَّافِعٍ مُحَصِّلْ لِلْمَقْصُودِ هو الرضا بعد وقوع القضاء لا قبله فإن ذلك عزم على الرضا فإذا وقع القضاء انفسخ ذلك العزم سأل الرضا بعده فإن المقدور يكتنفه أمران الاستخارة قبل وقوعه والرضا بعد وقوعه And Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he goes on explaining any, some of the details of this dua. But as we mentioned, the uh, <coughs> purpose of him mentioning this dua, the purpose of him mentioning this dua was the statement that is found and he, at the end of the dua, O oh Allah, and I ask you for the pleasure of looking at your face and the anxiousness to meet you. And the anxiousness to meet you. After explaining some things about the dua, he says, "One maqsood anna hu jama'a fi hadha du'a bina atiya bima bina atiya bima fi dunya wa atiya bima fi al-akhirah. Fa inna haja al-ibad ila Rabbihi fi ibadatihim iya wa ta'alluhihim la ka hajatihim ilayhi fi khalqihi lahum." Allah. He said, "The entire point here is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gathered in this du'a." between the most enjoyable thing in this world and the most enjoyable thing in the hereafter. He says, for verily the need of these slaves for their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their recognizing Him as their deity. The need that the slaves have to worship Allah and to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their deity is comparable to their need 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create them. Just as they could not have come into existence without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no purpose, there is no benefit in their lives without their worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the need of the slaves to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognizing Allah as their deity is just as great as their need that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them iyahum and provided for them. وَمُعَافَاتِ abdanihim And gives them felicity and comfort for their bodies. For their bodies. وَسَتْرِ awratihim And conceals their faults. وَأَمْنِ رَوْعَاتِهِمْ And protects them from that which they are terrified of. بَلْ حَاجَتُهُمْ إِلَى تَعَلُّهِهِ وَمَحَبَّتِهِ وَعُبُودِيَّتِهِ عَظَمُ He said in this, as a matter of fact, the need that they have to recognize Allah as their deity and love Allah and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more tremendous than all of that. فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْغَيَةُ الْمَقْصُودَةُ لَهُمْ He says, for verily, that is the objective that is intended from them. وَلَا صَلَحَ لَهُمْ وَلَا نَعِيمْ وَلَا فَلَحْ وَلَا لَذَّهْ وَلَا سَعَادَ بِدُونِ ذَلِكَ بِحَالْ and there is no way that a person can have bliss or happiness or success or pleasure or enjoyment in this world without his worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no way he can have that in any way whatsoever. وَلِهَذَا كَانَتْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَحْسَنَ الْحَسَنَاتِ He said, and for this reason, the statement لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ is the best act of obedience. It is the best of good deeds. وَكَانَ تَوْحِيدُ الْإِلَهِيَّةِ رَأْسَ الْأَمْرِ وَأَمَّا تَوْحِيدُ الرُّبُوبِيَّةِ الَّذِي أَقَرَّ بِيهِ الْمُسْلِمُ وَالْكَافِرُ وَقَرَّرَهُ أَهْلُ الْكَلَامِ فِي كُتُبِهِمْ فَلَا يَكْفِي وَحْدَهِ He said, and for this reason, the Tawheed of worship is the most important affair in the religion. As for the Tawheed of Lordship, that Allah singling out Allah as being the only creator, provider, controller, sustainer, and so on and so forth, he said, that which is admitted to by both the Muslims and the non-Muslims and that which is mentioned by the and discussed by the people of rhetoric by the philosophers in their books then this by itself when they explain Tawheed to be the Tawheed of Rububiyyah this is not enough by itself that you recognize that Allah is the controller of all benefit and harm and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, provider, sustainer he said this is not enough by itself بَلْ هُوَ الْحُجَّةُ عَلَيْهِمْ but rather it is the hujjah upon all of the creation it is the evidence, it is the proof against them كَمَا بَيَّنَ ذَانِكَ سُبْحَانَ وَتَعَالَى فِي كِتَابِهِ فِي عِدَّةِ مَوَاضِعِ as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he explained in his book in a number of places وَلِهَذَا كَانَ حَقُّ اللَّهِ عَلَى عِبَادِهِ أَنْ يَعْبُدُوهُ وَلَا يُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا كَمَا فِي الْحَدِيثِ الصَّحِيحِ الَّذِي رَوَاهُ مُعَادِ بِنُ جَبَرَ رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم He said, and for this reason, the right of Allah upon his ibad is that they worship him and do not make shirk with him in any way whatsoever. As is come in the authentic hadith from Mu'ad ibn Jabal رضي الله عنه that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, تَدْرِي مَا حَقُّ اللَّهِ عَلَى عِبَادِهِ قُلْتُ وَاللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ عَلَمْ قَالَ حَقُّهُ عَلَى عِبَادِهِ أَنْ يَعْبُدُوهُ وَلَا يُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا أَتَدْرِي مَا حَقُّ الْعِبَادِ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِذَا فَعَلُوا ذَلِكْ قُلْتُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ عَلَمُ قَالَ حَقُّهُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ لَا يُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِالنَّار The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Do you know what is the right of Allah upon his ibad? He said, I said Allah and his messenger know better. He said, his right upon his ibad, upon his slaves, is that they worship him alone and do not make partners with him and with anyone in any way whatsoever. He said, do you know what is the right of the ibad upon Allah if they were to do that? He said, I said Allah and His Messenger know better. He said, their right upon Him is that He does not punish them in the fire. وَلِذَلِكَ يُحِبُّ سُبْحَانَهُ عِبَادُهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْمُوَحِّدِينَ وَيَفْرَحُ بِتَوْبَتِهِمْ Ibn Qayyim, he closes this second aspect of explaining why the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most powerful thing to correct the person's heart and to give life to their heart and happiness to their heart and correct the entirety of their life. He says, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him. He says, and for this reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves his believing servants who single him out in worship and he rejoices. He is happy when they repent, subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
كما أن في ذلك عظم أن في ذلك عظم لذة العبد وسعادته ونعيمه فليس في الكائنات شيء غير الله سبحانه وتعالى يسكن القلب إليه ويطمئن به ويأنس به ويتنعم بتوجه إليه ومن عبد غيره سبحانه وحصل له به نوع منفعة ولذة فمضرته بذلك أضعاف أضعاف منفعته He said just as when they repent to Allah and when they worship Allah and single him out with worship subhanahu wa ta'ala they find the greatest bliss and happiness and pleasure from that he said for verily there is nothing in existence besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the heart that will ever cause a heart to truly feel peace and comfort and that the heart will feel bliss by directing itself towards and whoever worships anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and finds some type of momentary benefit or pleasure then the harm that they will truly get by worshiping anything besides Allah is many times beyond whatever type of perceived benefit they can get he said and a person by doing so will be like a person who eats delicious food that is poisoned a person who eats delicious food that is poisoned and you have a slight any amount of enjoyment and pleasure so on and so forth but it's going to kill you he said, just as it is the case that if there were to be more than one God in the heavens and the earth and the entirety of the heavens and the earth will fall into disrepair and become ruin, then likewise, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anbiya, that if there had been alihatun in Allah, and if there had been as they claim other gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the heavens and the earth would have fallen into disrepair and become corrupted. Then likewise the heart. If there is something that is worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will be corrupt in such a way, la yurja salahuhu, and he, that it will be hopeless to be corrected unless the person removes from his heart that which he is worshipping besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa yakun Allahu wahdahu ilahahu wa ma'budahu ladhi yuhibbuhu wa yarujuh wa yakhafuhu wa yatawakkalu alayhi wa yunibu ilayhi. And until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone becomes that which is recognized to be its deity and its object of worship that it loves to the highest degree and it hopes and it places its hope and its fear and its reliance upon and it makes al-inaba to him subhanahu wa ta'ala returning back to him subhanahu wa ta'ala for the day of meeting. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make what we heard from these tremendous words hujjatanana la alayna and to protect us and our children from falling into a shirku billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam inshallah and monday we'll continue reading from al wajhul thalith on the third aspect of this sixth chapter of the fact that the only way for the person to ever find happiness and enjoy their life and have an enjoyable any existence in this world is by Allah is by knowing Allah, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala their highest ambition and the extent of their aspiration. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.